D'abord, James, excusez-moi de ne pas être dîne, venu dîner avec vous, mais pour une fois, je voulais absolument revoir le film sur cet écran de, de la salle Henri Langlois, et j'ai eu raison parce que c'est encore mieux la seconde fois. Première question, euh, on sait que c'est un projet très ancien, on en a entendu parler déjà il y a longtemps. Est-ce que vous pensez que si le film a mis presque dix ans à se faire, c'est à cause de son coût, de ses difficultés de production, de la défection à un moment de Brad Pitt comme acteur Ou est-ce que c'est profondément lié à sa nature même C'est-à-dire quelque chose qui est sur l'incertitude, l'illusion et peut-être finalement la déception Yeah. Um, if we want to make films, we're always hostage to and sometimes beneficiary of uh, a world which is uh, run essentially by uh, market economics. So when you want to make a film about an explorer who essentially is a failure in traditional terms, uh, and who, whose obsession grows and then ultimately destroys everything, uh, that's not the thing that you can base action figures and lunchboxes on. But I think it goes further than that because I think it does go to a sclerosis um, because this is the kind of movie that they could have made, we could have made 25 to 30 years ago not easily, but with a little bit of a little bit more ease and a little bit more scale. So really, your your question, it, it's sort of the answer is all of the above. You know, it's uh, there are all these reasons that come into play, and I knew that I had wanted to make the film in South America and in England as well, Ireland, Northern Ireland, UK, because. Uh, I felt that it was very important to get a certain authenticity for the indigenous peoples of Amazonia. The thematic core of the movie necessitated a commitment to portraying the tribes of Amazonia as independent actors, uh, not reliant on the white man. And if I had made the film, I could have made the film years before that, if I had made it in... Asia or um, South Africa, or places that would have been cheaper to make the movie. But I vowed not to do that because I thought that getting a portrayal of the indigenous Amazonian correct, or at least honest, uh, was central to the movie's existence. And I didn't want to screw around with that. Alors James, si c'est aussi important pour vous ce, ce souci d'avoir tourné vraiment en Amérique du Sud et ce souci d'avoir vraiment travaillé avec des Indiens d'Amérique du Sud, est-ce que vous considérez que dans l'histoire qu'on vient de voir, malgré tout, c'est-à-dire malgré la mort du héros et de son fils, malgré les massacres des Indiens, malgré le mot de Claude Lévi-Strauss qui disait qu'il haïssait les explorateurs est-ce que vous pensez que, pour une fois, quand même, la rencontre a eu lieu C'est-à-dire que, d'habitude, la rencontre entre des peuples qu'on qualifie à un moment de primitifs ou indigènes et l'homme blanc se solde toujours par des massacres, de la destruction, de la colonisation. Est-ce que là, vous considérez que, malgré cette fin à la fois incertaine et tragique, une forme de rencontre a eu lieu You know, I'm the worst person to ask about this sort of thing because every film I've made, I feel like I have communicated the absolute wrong thing to the audience. I remember, um, I remember when uh, I made uh, La Nuit Nous Appartient. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Um, and uh, I remember thinking, okay, I have made a total anti-cop movie. My intention was totally to condemn it and that the, the two brothers at the end say, I love you, I meant it to be totally ironic. 
and very dark, and he's given up this life of clubbing and this lovely girlfriend he had, and he goes into the fold, and there I, the movie screened, and everyone said, you made a pro-cop movie, you asshole. So I thought, oh, that's not good. And then I remember I made Two Lovers, and the ending, everyone said, isn't that nice? Joaquin Phoenix winds up with the right person. <laughs> and so after a while, you begin to realize that regardless of what I think, you guys have the final say. Uh, my own view is, and that's by the way, way, the way it should be, really. I just don't like that I'm not competent enough to convey what it is I actually feel. So to, in, in, in this movie, what it meant to me was that human beings, at least in my own view of the world and through history, have a terrifying and horrifying commitment to a hierarchy and to ranking people in terms of ethnicity or gender or religious belief. And so the whole meaning of the film for me was that everybody seems to be put in some kind of box. And I'm not sure that even the indigenous peoples of Amazonia rose above that. I didn't want to romanticize it either, you know, and which is why I had one member of a group throwing a spear and hitting the other. As if to say that no one is immune from the struggle of what it means to be a person. In Fawcett's case, social class made a huge uh, impact on who he was, the unfolding of his life, and uh, 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 motivated so much of what he did. And I felt to tragic effect. This is a very commercial idea, and probably why it was very easy to get the film made. Um, and I feel that that extends to the indigenous people don't understand him, but he doesn't understand them. There is a transcendence, I feel, to his ending, which is that he has seen something that virtually no uh, white people from Europe in that time period or today would see. On the other hand, his life is abbreviated, and he's brought his son to his death. So to me, it was a complicated and complex story, because when we talk about American cinema, um, obviously all movies are political in one way or another. But when you talk about American movies, they're very resistant, extremely resistant to talking about class. And uh, they tend to try and shy away from the idea that history is a determining aspect of behavior. Uh, I, I, I sort of wanted to move against that and say that it's kind of everything. But it is also the magic of, for me, for me, uh, narrative. Because narrative enables you essentially to build both text and subtext. Now, this does not mean I'm denouncing other kinds of movies, but I, I come from a certain narrative tradition, uh, and that's why I tried to use the classical form as a way to uh, explore what I think are actually quite dark themes. Et en même temps. Vous êtes un drôle de cinéaste américain, si vous êtes un cinéaste américain, parce que j'ai vu deux fois le film, et donc je me suis aperçu qu'il y avait deux plans sur les restes de la cité perdue. Et ces plans sont quand même pleins d'incertitudes, c'est-à-dire qu'on ne sait pas exactement ce qu'on a vu, Fawcett lui-même ne sait pas exactement ce qu'il a vu, et il me semble que dans un film américain, soit ces plans auraient été plus longs, Soit on aurait fait un raccord dans l'axe pour faire un gros plan sur ces statues, pour dire aux spectateurs exactement s'il y avait quelque chose à voir. Tandis que là, on n'est pas tout à fait sûr si c'est la réalité ou si c'est une apparition. Est-ce que ça, on peut dire quand même que ça vous distingue Vous savez, je suis très heureux parce que j'ai grandi dans une ville in New York City in the late 1970s, and my exposure to not just American movies, but to the movies from the rest of the world was pretty vast. When I got to the University of Southern California, which was 1987 when I got there, I had seen way more films than anybody else in my class. And what that, I think, 
my influences tend to be not only American movies, really. That they're sort of weird. And I think that in some respects, although over the last two films, the response in the United States has been very good to my work. But before that, there was a resistance because they seemed like studio movies, but there's something a little off about them. And of course, like I said, they're very dark. I think that comes from, and the things that you're talking about in your question come from uh, a real love of, frankly, movies that aren't American. So they turn out to be a very weird hybrid. So the idea of satisfying the audience, which would be, for example, a, oh, he sees the lost city. Uh, I'm naturally very resistant to that. But I, I believe very firmly in the idea that the audience, it's important that you satisfy the audience, but I would distinct, distinguish that from exploiting the audience, that there's a very big difference. So I suppose it's me being a jerk that I'm not satisfying you completely. He doesn't find this huge, great thing. But I don't feel like that's what life is about anyway. I don't feel like, maybe you guys have this experience. I, my experience is quite a bit more fraught. So the, the idea of making, if I may use a dirty word, art, it's not about wish fulfillment. Even in the greatest films that appear to be wish fulfillment. You know, I just watched Broadway Melody of 1940, which is Fred Astaire and Eleanor Powell. And they have this begin the begin routine at the end of the film. I think it's something like six and a half minutes long. It is magic and it is fulfilling all of your dreams, but you cannot dance like Fred Astaire. So instantly there is the acknowledgement of the transcendent, that which we cannot reach. By the way, Fred Astaire couldn't dance like Fred Astaire, right? He needed lots of takes and things like that. Although in Begin the Begin, there's no cut. So this idea of making a film which doesn't answer every question, which doesn't give us every answer, which doesn't make us very comfortable to be alive, I think is critically important. C'est une excellente réponse, mais dans mon idée, c'était plutôt un compliment. C'est-à-dire que je préfère effectivement qu'un film nous laisse quelque chose à rêver plutôt que de nous montrer avec une absolue certitude ce qu'il veut nous montrer. Par ailleurs, dès le début du film, peut-être que ce n'est pas perceptible pour un public américain, mais ici c'est très perceptible parce que même les hommes politiques en France et en Italie utilisent sans arrêt cette phrase. C'est-à-dire que vous mettez dans la bouche de Franco Nero, le roi du caoutchouc, qui a son opéra, je te laisse aller sur le fleuve et je te laisse aller à la rencontre des Indiens, mais débrouille-toi pour que rien ne change. Or, cette phrase, elle est très identifiable pour un spectateur de cinéma. C'est la phrase du guépard de Lucchino Visconti quand Alain Delon explique à Bert Lancaster pour que tout change, il faudra que rien ne change. Là, c'est une référence directe. Yes, <laughs> I agree. Et le guépard? No, I mean uh, that's one of my favorite movies ever. Uh, un de mes films préférés. Um, I remember seeing that movie. It's a funny story, at least funny to me. Uh, I saw that movie at the University of Southern California. They had a Burt Lancaster retros Burt Lancaster retrospective. I believe I was 19. I'm not going to tell you the names, but I saw it with three other people, all of whom are now directing very big movies. It's very interesting, at least for me, that not just the United States, but actually all of sort of market-based economies today have seen a real impact in the culture. And the creation of something like The Leopard, or certainly Rocco and his brothers before that, is the product of a world in which capitalism has Marxism, 
or socialist dictatorships as a counterweight of some kind. Today the market is God. And that has had terrible effects on art because the whole idea has become that you cannot question the market. So if you talk to young people today, as I have done now in, uh, around colleges in the United States, the term being a sellout doesn't have any meaning anymore. And the leopard's sense of history and its sense of uh, the economic forces that also help govern history, I think is an, a beautiful and antiquated one. And I mean antiquated in a good way, not in a bad way. And I don't think that's something, honestly, that is something totally gone from at least American discourse. I don't know how it feels here. I don't live here. But it's gone completely. So if you, if, if you think about the, the, the power of history and the power of economics, to me it feels like virtually everything in determining who we are. The leopard spoke very directly to me about that. And I tried to imp tried to give that a piece of that to the, in this film. I stole from that. Et vous avez eu la difficulté qui je trouve est très bien résolue par le film de montrer quelqu'un qui est un ambitieux, qui est un visionnaire, qui a aussi une revanche sociale à prendre, qui a des idées qui sont parfois en avance sur son temps, mais qui est aussi un homme de son temps, c'est-à-dire qui considère que la dispute avec sa femme à un moment, les choses s'arrêtent. Il a beau l'appeler Chippy, il a beau apprécier qu'elle soit visiblement un peu suffragette, euh, il lui redit où est, où est sa place. Et par ailleurs, il veut être reconnu par le corps social de son temps. Est-ce que dans l'écriture du scénario, vous avez fait particulièrement attention à ça, à essayer d'avoir cette complexité du du personnage qui est à la fois quelqu'un qui a des idées novatrices et qui, en même temps, est un homme de sa classe sociale en Angleterre. Yeah, that was the whole thing that got me excited about the book, was that somebody could be both in some ways a visionary and yet completely captive to the forces of the time. And I felt that the relationship that he had with his wife was again, a kind of way of uh, exploring this idea of the hierarchy that they looked down on him because of his family and he, in a way, kept his wife in a box as, as, as sort of ad advanced in his thinking as he was. She couldn't go along with him to the jungle. She had her place, you know, in mind, not in body, this whole thing. But so then there was an issue of obviously gender. And then, of course, with the indigenous people, that the white man looked down on the indigenous people. And the slave owners had the, the slave tenders, and slave tenders looked down on the slaves. That there was everybody had to be put in their own box. So the idea that the story had both a liberating quality, a visionary quality, but at the same time, the tremendous force that we have to fight against which exists to put us in our place and keep us there. Et vous parlez de, de box, de, de place de chacun. Finalement, si je regarde tous vos films depuis Little Odessa, j'ai l'impression que la question qui se pose à tous vos personnages, c'est à qui appartient-on Il y a toujours un, un conflit d'appartenance dans vos films. Et là, Mr. Fawcett, Effectivement, à qui appartient-il Est-ce qu'il appartient à sa classe Est-ce qu'il appartient à son pays Est-ce qu'il appartient à la société géographique anglaise Ou est-ce que finalement, il appartient à l'Amazonie C'est-à-dire, est-ce que la forêt ne, ne l'a pas gagné Et on a, on a l'impression que c'est la grande question de vos films. Les personnages sont toujours clivés, séparés, entre plusieurs appartenances contradictoires. Yes. Uh, I mean, to me, the, one of the most powerful things you can say is to depict a world order that is complex and that in which your identity is always in a, a, 
an uncomfortable place. That it seems to me the number one struggle that we face every day is where we fit in the world. I remember when I was a kid, I felt very good if I would go to bed and I would see the crack of the door, the bottom, the crack of the door, and it was lit up, meaning my parents were still awake when I went to bed. If I had to get up to go to the bathroom or something, I'm talking when I was like seven or eight, if I had to get up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and I still saw that light on, I felt okay. But the minute that light was off and they were asleep, I felt a terrible terror. And I think that that's something everybody feels. And it's the essential struggle of what it means to be a person. Et par ailleurs, dans un film comme celui-là, ça m'a aussi beaucoup frappé à la deuxième vision, où il y a des scènes que le spectateur de cinéma connaît. C'est-à-dire que dans un film d'aventure, à un moment, on va descendre la rivière, à un moment, les Indiens vont attaquer, il va y avoir des flèches, peut-être des piranhas. Et est-ce que vous vous êtes posé ces questions-là C'est-à-dire, est-ce que vous vous êtes dit, comment je vais essayer de représenter dans un genre déterminé, des sortes de, de passages obligés que le spectateur attend. Yes, there are elements, obviously, that you feel the need some, in some way to include. I was very worried about making a film about the white man's burden. You know, I was very worried about making a white man savior movie. And maybe I didn't succeed in the end, but what I was trying to do was to establish everybody's independent existence, that they weren't dependent on this white blonde haired guy to save them. He doesn't save anybody. In fact, the jungle sort of takes him. So I included the familiar, not because I had to make it up, it was already there in the book, but it was in a way the least interesting part of the story for me. I keep coming back to the same idea that what was important to me was this idea of how he tried to fill himself up, the idea of his identity, how he tried to become comfortable in a world that was not accepting of him. I have a very uncomfortable relationship with genre. You know, I like genre. I think it's a great way in. They call it the kind of Trojan horse idea. But I find myself very bored with doing exactly what... Like, I'm the idiot that did a car chase in the rain where he's being chased and he loses by the father getting killed. Like, nothing works out for him. That's the car chase. Every other car chase I watched, I didn't even think about it until afterwards. The guy, it's a guy chasing somebody else that we're following. Steve McQueen's chasing somebody. You know, Gene Hackman's chasing me. I'm the idiot that makes it where he's being, you know, destroyed. His life is being ruined. So obviously I have some problem with convention. Um, and sometimes convention is good. This is not me complimenting myself. Sometimes convention is good. And I have a natural desire to get away from that. It's not always healthy. Vous vous échappez des conventions et là vous êtes très audacieux, je trouve, dans ce film, dans votre façon de, de monter des flashs et d'interpénétrer de, les deux mondes. C'est-à-dire que le monde de l'Angleterre peut être un flash visuel quand il est dans la jungle et qu'à la fin, on a l'impression d'une fusion qui est peut-être celle de la mort ou de, ou de la rêverie, je ne sais pas. Mais c'est très gonflé, enfin c'est très audacieux de, de faire ces très courts plans, comme ça, d'un monde à l'autre, comme s'ils se répondaient. Est-ce que c'est quelque chose que vous aviez écrit dès le scénario, ou est-ce que c'est quelque chose, cette forme de raccord, que vous avez trouvé au montage This was always part of the original design. It was always my way of trying to express a corny way to put it, a pathetic way to put it, would be human beings are, the, the struggles are not so different. 
uh, halfway around the world. And I did not want to exoticize the jungle. If anything, I wanted to make sure that the audience felt they were almost the same. There are physical hardships. You know, you go to the jungle. I remember Charlie Hunnam had a bug that was burrowing its way into his ear canal, and I think five days into the first, you know, week of shooting. Um, and those are, but those are physical difficulties. And you realize that in the end, there is a great commonality. And I don't mean a common hope that we all have to hold hands. That's not what I mean. What I mean is that the struggle is the same. There was one more thing I would say about that last question. And it's part of the reason that Stravinsky is used a little bit. There was this idea of the primitive as a kind of exotic, freeing, sexually freeing thing, which is inherently racist. And uh, I kind of wanted to say the opposite of that. A kind of um, approach to like listening to Stravinsky that almost would conjure the idea of like the sexual and the primitive, but saying that the opposite is the case. You know, to, to idealize, for Western Europeans and Amer North Americans to idealize that is in a way vulgar and racist. Et il y a une image, je m'en suis mieux aperçu la seconde fois en voyant le film ce soir, c'est que je ne suis pas sûr, peut-être parce que j'étais très ému la première fois, mais qu'à la fin, elle rentre quand même dans une jungle. C'est-à-dire qu'on a l'impression que cette lutte, des struggles dont vous parliez entre, entre les deux mondes, l'image de la fin est presque une synthèse. C'est-à-dire que sa femme entre littéralement dans une, dans une sorte de jungle amazonienne. I mean, yeah, that was the whole point to the last shot. I needed to try to explain the breakdown between the wall, between the two worlds, and also to say that the same obsession that had destroyed him would of course swallow her up as well. So then you have to say, well visually, how do I explain that? It was a very strange set, I will say that. We had a Victorian house somewhere in England, and this long greenhouse sort of sticking out the front door And I'm sure that the neighbors wanted to kill me. Mais c'est ça, ça qui est impressionnant. Well, it was a very weird moment. And I think it, take, it was weird because I think that shot took something like 27 takes. I think you're seeing take 27. I don't know why it was so hard, but it was the speed of the move and I was a crazy person and I wanted it to be the camera move independently of her and all this stuff. I, I, I hope it communicates this idea, but I'd wanted it to be about an almost, uh, not democratizing is the wrong word, but the breakdown between the exotic and the quotidian, and also to say that it swallowed her up. So this was very much part, and that was originally, that was always part of the calculus. Mais tout à fait, c'est tout à fait ça, et c'est pour ça que... Vous êtes, je pense, un cinéaste si intéressant sur ces questions-là, c'est que vous êtes un cinéaste littéral. C'est-à-dire que vous ne faites pas une symbolique de la chose, mais littéralement, vous la filmez en train d'entrer dans un jardin, en train d'entrer dans une jungle. Alors c'est peut-être aussi ce qui provoque parfois des malentendus sur vos films, mais vous montrez les choses telles qu'elles sont, pas de façon symbolique, mais de façon littérale. Mais je vous demande pas d'être d'accord. Hein. You're going to keep liking me and liking my stuff. I'm going to agree. It's very good that my wife is not here because she will ask me to take out the garbage and everything. And if she were here, I would say, no, no, but you heard what that man was saying. And then, I don't have to take out the garbage. I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm flip. I've always believed that there is a huge difference between being vague and being ambiguous. And it's okay to be literal on the surface. What's important is that your film convey a certain ambiguity. 
not be vague. In other words, what the hell's happening here, honey? Versus, I understand it completely, but the implications of it are rather mult multitudinous. I mean, if you were to watch Bunuel movies, it's you don't have a you don't wonder what's happening in them. They actually are weirdly very literal. Now, you would never say Bunuel is literal, but I don't think that's an insult. No, moi je pense que Bunuel est complètement littéral et que c'est un compliment. Yeah. But that's also vertigo, en français, vertigo, um, <laughs> is, uh, is very literal, actually. You know exactly what's happening, but the, the, there is no limit to human subjectivity. So it's, a, it's why it comes back to why I'm such a huge fan of narrative, because I feel that it exposes and reveals itself over time in very different ways if the investment is made in the subtext. Et par ailleurs, ça m'a beaucoup étonné, vous avez donné une très bonne interview à la revue Positif ce mois-ci, qui fait la couverture avec votre film. Euh, et vous dites que non seulement vous avez tourné avec Darius Kanji au fin fond de la Colombie en pellicule argentique, mais que donc vous ne pouviez pas voir les rushs. Et ça, quelqu'un quelqu d'aussi minutieux que vous, qui se retrouve au fond de la jungle et qui, en plus, doit attendre que ces rushs reviennent du laboratoire pour savoir si ça convient à votre vision, je me suis vraiment demandé pourquoi vous vous étiez imposé à vous-même cette difficulté supplémentaire. To be honest... Uh I don't watch dailies anyway. Um, Même quand c'est pas dans la jungle. What? <laughs> no, I, I don't watch them. I'm there on the set. Why do I need to watch them? I see what I, I, I did. Either I, the mistake I made or didn't. And the truth is, watching dailies is a totally is total folly. You know, I, I, I used to hear stories about Robert Altman, and he would have dailies. You know, at, after the shooting and. And he, everybody would get together and they'd smoke a lot of pot and it would be a great thing. And, you know, got the, you know, the, but that actually sort of weirdly proves my point that nobody really gives a shit about dailies because you get in the edit room and the story is, you know, you are the story's bitch. You, you, have, to, you have to make the footage work and context is your enemy. And all of a sudden the dailies that you saw where Vanessa Redgrave was dying with such elegance and you thought you were a genius... You know, you get into the edit room and it's like all of a sudden in context, it's horrible. So what the hell good is watching the dailies? You got it wrong, fine, good luck to me. I got it wrong, I'm an idiot. How do I fix it? So I never understood the directors like, I'm watching my dailies over and over and over. It's like, <laughs> okay. And when I get to the edit room, any dailies I might have watched, it doesn't matter what I thought of them. I mean, you have, it's, I, I don't know, but it's different for everybody. It's different. For, obviously, everybody has different methods, so I'm not saying that. But for me, it doesn't matter to me. You watch the dailies. I'm there on the set. I don't have to watch them in the fil on film. As long as I got an exposure, I know I got, the, I got an exposure. So It's actually not true. I didn't always know I got an exposure. Three days I didn't get an exposure. So what am I talking about? Three days came back bam, to the jungle. But if you're asking about film versus digital, that's a different question. I prefer film. Now, that does not mean that people have, cannot make beautiful films digitally. It happens all the time. There are many fantastic filmmakers who work in that medium. My taste is for film. I feel that there's something very organic about it. I can get into the technical nonsense, which is something called temporal resolution, but there are already people are leaving in droves, so we best skip that part. And I will just say that I think that the image responds in a more painterly fashion with film. So I made the decision because I felt that with film, there's a strange melancholy to the image that instantly makes, relegates that image, that frame to the past. Digital for reasons that I think I can't really expatiate on in detail feels much more immediate. 
So it can have a great use. But this is about the past and it's about the irretrievability of that past. A melancholy that I was after. And I felt that film endorsed that. C'est vrai que dans votre premier film, et même peut-être la première séquence de votre premier film, c'était un garçon dans un cinéma très cheap de Broadway et qui voyait le western qu'il était en train de regarder s'enflammer à l'écran. À l'époque, on projetait encore en pellicule et quand la pellicule se bloquait, le projecteur brûlait la pellicule. Mélancolie. Well, I mean, there's a very famous essay, a Susan Sontag essay called On Photography, which is very famous and great. If you haven't read it, you should. Which is all about what I'm talking about, which is that the second you take a photograph, it's an irretrievable past. I always found that very beautiful. But in the end, if you can boil down all of the things that you want to do, that you dream of doing, as a filmmaker, or really in any art form, I think that if you aspire to be an artist, you're really trying only one thing, ultimately, I, th I think, which is the most exact transcription, I've said this before, it's to quote Edward Hopper, the painter, the most exact transcription of your most intimate impressions. So you can forget all of the rest of the stuff about history and politics and what you're trying to say with a character. And in the end, what you're really trying to do is to convey a nonverbal feeling that you have always felt from within. Pour terminer, James Ray, j'aurais pu garder euh, ça pour vous et moi euh, dans la coulisse, mais je préfère quand même vous le dire devant tout le monde. Ça vous embête si on vous dit que votre film est plein d'allusions à Stanley Kubrick Really? Really? Which one? Barry Lyndon? Yes. <laughs> Why, there's like English people in it talking? I don't no. know, I mean... Uh... <laughs> no, parce que la scène, par exemple, où il refuse d'embrasser son père quand il sort du bateau, ressemble beaucoup à la scène où Lord Bullington, dans Barry Lyndon, refuse d'embrasser son beau-père. Yeah, of course, I remember that, and I love Barry Lyndon. I love Barry Lyndon, I mean, I love it, but... I'm sure I stole from it. Uh, I'm sure I, st I steal from everything. I mean, I, I, I once wrote an email to Francis Coppola right when I met him, or right when I got in contact with him. This was before I'd actually even met him. This is 20 years ago now. And I sent him an email. Basically, it was really a nauseating, disgusting email. And it said, you know, Mr. Coppola, I love you. You're the greatest. I've stolen everything from you. And he wrote back such a great thing. He wrote, my dear James, because I said I've stolen everything from you. He wrote back, my dear James, go ahead. That's what it's there for. <laughs> Which I thought was so great. So if I'm stealing from Mr. Kubrick, I could steal from worse. <laughs> merci beaucoup, James Gray. Et merci beaucoup à Gabriela Curillo qui a assuré la traduction. <laughs>